Hey Grinder School, this is CF the Natural, and welcome to another episode of Key Concepts in PLO. This is episode number five, and the topic for today is check raising. Okay, so check raising in PLO. As always, let's look over the uh, topics that we're going to be covering. <clears throat> First, I'm going to be defining what I mean by check raising. I think everybody knows what a check raise is, obviously. I don't mean it that way, but I mean that there are various types of check raising. And the only kind we're really going to focus on today is check raising as a bluff. Okay. Uh, check raising when you got the nuts is, you know, a whole different animal and it's not really that complicated or that difficult. Uh, as a friend of mine likes to say, it's, you know, it's pretty easy to play when you got quads, right? It doesn't, doesn't, a chimpanzee could, could play quads. Maybe there's a little bit of skill involved in how to extract maximum value, but it's not hard to play when you got the nuts, okay? That's not exactly a challenge. So I'm not going to cover stuff like that very often, right? You all know how to play the nuts. Um, but I had mentioned in a, a few of my videos where I've done live, um, uh, you know, live play videos and, and other presentations that I've been working on a sort of uh, picking spots that are good for check raising as a bluff when I really have basically air. And that's what I want to talk about today is that type of check raising. So I'm going to define it specifically. I'm going to talk about the benefits of check raising, then the board textures, which is probably the most important factor in choosing when to check raise as a bluff is the type of board to do it on the number and type of opponents that we want to do it against primarily. Then talk a little bit about check raising when we have, say, some equity. Not a lot of equity. I'm not talking, again, a, a check raising for value, but we have something more than air. Then I'm going to give some hand history examples. I'm going to go into my database. I've marked several hands. I think I've got six hands where I chose spots to check raise with complete air. And then, as always, I'm going to finish up with a summary. Okay, <clears throat> there are four ways basically that we can check raise. We can check raise for value, meaning obviously when we have the nuts or, or something close, uh, like on a 9-9 nine, nine deuce board and we have a 9 in our hand and say an ace kicker, we didn't flop a full house, but clearly that is a check raise for value. We have trips with the best possible kicker, we have a very strong hand. And even if somebody has a full house, we can still outdraw them. Because if uh, an ace or one of our other cards comes, it's going to be to deuce. Second, it can be done as a semi-bluff, where you have you know some equity like a draw or something like that. Third, with total air, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Or finally, with a big draw uh, to maximize fold equity. And when you do check raise with a big draw, the idea is that you're kind of, uh, it's a double whammy. You have a big draw, so you have a lot of cards. Hopefully, we're talking 12 plus outs that you could hit, or certainly at least like 11 outs. You know, say you have an over pair and a flush draw. So you could now have two outs for your set and then nine outs for your flush. So that's a minimum of 11 outs. Well, not minimum, maximum, I guess, but you know what I mean. So you're looking at, say, 45% equity to hit, plus, of course, the fold equity. Your opponent, and if they don't have a pretty good hand, they're going to have to let it go. So you combine the fold equity with the equity that you have and uh, check raising with a strong draw can, can be very powerful. <clears throat> but when we talk about check raising with air, that takes a lot of fortitude, okay? It takes, it takes a lot of stones, uh, as I would say, right? You don't have brass balls. It's not easy to do because let's face it, if we get called or re-raised, uh, the jig is up, as they say, right? I mean, the hand is done for us. When you raise with absolute, you know, complete, nothing. Um, if somebody calls you, you're done. There's really basically no card that's going to come on the turn that's going to give you enough equity, assuming that they have what you think they have, right? And on the type of boards that I'm going to show you, we do it on, if they have what you're, you're representing, right? So when we're check raising, we're representing a, a pretty nutted hand. If they actually have it, meaning a flush or trips or something, there's virtually nothing you can hit that's going to beat them. So you just have to give up at that point. So it is uh, an all or nothing play, right? It's a suicide play. It either succeeds and you're the hero or it fails and you're the goat. But it's just money, right? And so, you know, such as it is, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but 
it is an all or nothing type of play. However, it, it is a very powerful tool when properly utilized okay, in Omaha. And that's something that I have learned. I've been studying some more, uh, shall we say, advanced techniques, if you will, in, in Omaha beyond uh, just playing as a, you know, a tight tag and, and uh, looking for good spots to get my money in and taking advantage of weak players. That, that works very well for me. It makes me good money. But you're always looking to better yourself as a player. And when I do play against players like myself and, and competent opponents, you have to look for other ways to beat these guys. It's not going to be enough to just sit there and wait for big hands because even when you do get them, these guys aren't going to pay you off, right? Unless you cooler them, they're not going to pay you off. The only way I'm, I'm winning a full stack or even anything close to that against an opponent like myself is if I have the nuts and they have the second nuts. It's just almost no other way. So I've got to look for other opportunities, and this is one of them. Uh, but bear in mind that when you're going to do this, check raising with, with air, it's got to be done in the right spot and against the right opponent or opponents. Okay, so the first benefit of check raising is it just makes you much tougher to play against. Okay, once you put the fear of God in somebody, okay, once somebody realizes that you're capable of doing this and you're ready and willing to do it, it's really hard for them to forget it. If any of you grew up with brothers or sisters, especially like a brother or something, right, and you remember that he would uh, jump out and punch you in the arm without warning, right, or, or the, your, your sister would jump out and say boo when you were a little kid. My sister, older sister, used to love to do that when I was like five or six years old and I was a very young child. She'd wait behind something and as I walked by, she'd jump out and say boo. And, and I was, you know, a kindergartner, right? It scared the crap out of me. Well, once she did that a couple of times, every corner I went around, I was worried my sister was there, right? It put the fear of God in me, and I started walking around paranoid that she was going to jump out and scare me. Um, and it's kind of the same, you know, in PLO. Once you check raise somebody in a couple of spots, they start to tread very lightly. They start to say, well, crap, you know, I don't know if I want to see bet this board because I could get check raised. There's nothing worse than getting check raised and having to just give up immediately. And it's just it's just dead money, right? It's just money flushed down the toilet, okay? So it makes you a lot tougher to, to go up against if you have that tool in your toolbox, right? If you're able to pick the spots and do it, it is going to make people think twice. Uh, secondly, uh, and this goes in line with that, it buys you free cards in the future, okay? Because once these people get that fear of God in them, once they start checking back more flops to you when you check to them, uh, that is a huge advantage to you, okay? Because it allows us to realize equity out of position, okay? So if you think about it, the worst spot to be in in poker after the flop is out of position with nothing, okay? I can't think of anything that is less likely for you to win the hand than if you're out of position and you have complete air, okay? Because you got no equity and you don't have position, and if you think about it, when you're in that spot, you know, really the only way to win the hand is, is probably to check raise. Um, yeah, you could hope to check down and maybe they have worse air than you do. Um, but most of the time, it's not going to check through all the way to the river. Okay. So if you're sitting there with a 10 high and you're hoping to check three streets and your opponent has an eight high, um, you know, you better keep wishing because that's just not going to happen much. Okay. So... Once they start checking back to us and not see betting every time, well, now all of a sudden we have a chance on the turn to pick up some equity. Okay, all of a sudden we can pick up a pair, we can pick up a flush draw. You know, if we had a back door, something can happen. And that's a huge plus because generally when you're out of position with no equity, you're going to lose that hand, you know, 95% of the time. Finally, it allows us to win hands that we're not supposed to win. Okay, and as I was just saying, when you're out of position with air, you're, you're basically not supposed to win that hand, okay? Especially against more than one opponent. There's just, your odds are so low of getting to the river and having the best hand. But when you can turn the tables and check raise and force your opponents to give you credit for a big hand and fold, you're winning hands you're not supposed to win. And that really ups your long-term win rate, okay? It's one thing to win hands you're supposed to win when you hit a big hand and, and getting good value. But when you pick up money in hands that you are not supposed to be winning at all, that is a big boon to your win rate so it's a huge plus. Now let's talk about the most important factor in my opinion at least in determining where's a good spot to 
check raise with nothing. And there are a few factors. We're going to go over all of them, but I think the most important factor is the board texture, picking the right kind of board. Because PLO is a game of the nuts, okay? And so basically there are certain boards out there where either you hit them or you don't, okay? You hit, if you hit the board, you've got a big hand, and if you miss it, you miss it completely. I mean, you just, you're, whatever you have, it's just worthless against a, a hand that hit that board. And so when you rep that you hit the board, if your opponents didn't, they just have to instantly give up, okay? Um, so the first kind of board is pretty obvious, and that's a monotone board, right? Those are really good boards to check raise on because basically a non-flush is drawing dead, okay? The only kind of hands that have any equity on a monotone board, if you don't have a flush, is a set or two pair. And really, in my opinion, just a set. Two pair is you're drawing to four outs. If somebody has a flush and you have two pair, if you don't have anything else on there, like like a straight draw or something like that, actually a straight draw is no good against a flush. That'd be if they were bluffing. So really, if they have a flush and you have two pair, I stand corrected. The only thing you're drawing to is a full house. That's it. So you have four outs. If the board is 10, 7, 3, and you have 10s and 7s, there are at most two more 10s and two more 7s in the deck. So you have four outs maximum with two cards to come. So that's about 18% equity. You're going to lose that hand 82% of the time. And when it comes to the turn, you have less than 10% equity. Okay, there you're a once so if they check raise and you call and the turn does not give you a 10 or a 7, you are now less than 1 in 10 to win that hand. So, it's awful tough to call that check raise with two pair. I do see people calling on monotone boards with a set I will occasionally call a smaller bet with a set because I can hit a full house. I can win a big pot. I won't call a check raise because I just know that my odds are not very good. After the turn, you have 10 outs to fill up with a set. Nine outs for a full house and one out for quads. So with one card to come, you're only about 22%, 23% to hit maximum if none of the other cards are held by somebody. So you're still like a 77 78% dog okay you're not even one in four to win the hand and you could be much less if other people hold some cards the second kind of board that's really good to check raise on is a paired board and that's because other than trips there's just so few hands that have enough equity to to peel on a board like that okay especially at the high price of a check raise <clears throat> so again we're talking about a board that is like jack jack four if you don't have a jack you just don't have any equity. Think about it. Let's say you have a pair of aces, okay? Which in Hold'em, that'd be a jack-jack four is not a bad board. Um, not as good as jack four four because your opponent could have called a raise or raised with a jack in their hand, but the odds are they're not holding a jack because they only have two cards. Um, but in a spot like that, in PLO, if you have an over pair, you're drawing to two outs. Nothing short of an ace will beat this person, okay? Um... So, you know, uh, on the flop, you're two outs with, with two cards to come. You're less than one in ten to hit that ace, okay? Now, it's one thing if <clears throat> somebody just say the, the pot is, is, is a dollar and somebody bets 50 cents. Maybe you'll think about calling, peeling a card, right? Because you're not convinced they have a jack or, you know, something like that. They may be a, a loose opponent or they're in position. They're just c-betting on the board, you know. But if they check raise you, now all of a sudden it's three dollars and fifty cents you gotta pay instead of a you know fifty cents, right? You see bet and they raise you and now it's three fifty instead of fifty cents or whatever. That's a whole nother story calling calling through three fifty. So on paired boards, if you don't have trips, you just don't have the equity to be calling bets, especially not check raises. Maybe you can call a smallish uh see bet or something but you're not gonna not gonna be able to to, to peel uh, 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 against a check raise when you don't have trips yourself the third kind of board and these first two are the ones that I, I you'll see me do the most on these are the two best in my opinion monotone and paired but there are a couple others that are also good more against one opponent the third one is the high low low board okay these are the kind of boards that people see bet with very high frequency so a board like uh, king 7-3 uh, or uh, ace 5-deuce one high card and two low cards 
Uh, people see bet these a lot, especially heads up. Heads up, people are going to be see betting, you know, 70, 80 percent of the time on open. So it's a great board to see bet. One high card, two low cards, especially rainbow. But the truth is, people flop minimal equity on these. Okay, unless they hit that 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 top card, they really just don't have anything. They're looking at second pair at best. Um, so any pair below top pair, okay, is drawing very poorly. And so you're when you check raise them, you're repping basically two pair, a set which has them crushed, uh, or at worst, say, top pair, and then maybe a backdoor draw or some kind of draw to go with it. So if the board comes king, seven, three, and you check, they see bet, and you check raise, and say they have a pair of tens, say that they had raised with 10, 10, 9, 8, and now they have a pair of tens, and that's all they have, they just don't have enough equity to peel. Uh, and in particular, because if they do call, they say, well, I don't think he has a king. Uh, and I could still hit a runner, run or something. So they call you. Well, they have to be really wary because, um, and this says weary. It should say wary, I believe. So I apologize for uh, for that. Um, my bad. This this should say wary. Um, W-A-R-Y. My apologies. Just noticed that. My apology. Um there's the threat of future bets. And what I mean is, is that if they call and they don't hit something on the turn that improves them, in this case, like a 10, that's a two outer, right? To hit a 10 and give themselves trips or something that gives them, you know, a, a, a draw to the river, uh, they're going to have to fold immediately. So how many people want it? It's one thing, like I said, to call a C bet and then maybe give up on the turn. But when you get check raised and you have to call a large bet, a pot size re-raise, and then just give up on the turn when you don't improve, you're just throwing money away. So most competent players are very, very careful about, you know, calling on a board like this, a check raise, a high, low, low board, because they know that you're probably going to, you're not going to check raise and then just give up, right? You're going to check raise and probably be, because they don't know you're bluffing, you're probably going to be barreling the turn with another big bet. And they know that unless they hit a huge card, one of just a couple, three outs, they're going to have to give up. So those are very good boards to do it on. Mostly heads up though. The final board is called a lockdown board. That's a term that Phil Galfond uh, coined, I believe, uh, but it's, a, it's an interesting concept. Those are boards where there are just really few hands with equity against the current nuts. And so I gave a couple of examples here. We have five, six, nine rainbow. So if somebody has seven, eight, and they hit the nut straight on this board, the only hands with any equity here are, are like a set. And even then, as you know, you've got basically after the turn, 10 outs to hit your full house. So if you have 99XX on this board here, 569, you're about a 60-40 dog after the flop. So if the turn doesn't fill you up, you are now only have about 20% equity, 20, 22% equity, let's say, 22% equity after the turn. Okay, so they check raise you, you call, and the turn does not fill you up you still are sitting with a set, you're uh, going to lose more than three out of four times. Okay. Same with this board here, four, five, eight. If somebody has six, seven, if you have two pair, you've only got uh, about 23% equity. And after the turn, you're going to have around 12% equity. Uh, and with a set, again, you're, you have maybe 40% uh, at the flop, but after the turn, that's going to be cut in half almost. So, and those are the only hands with any equity. If you have an over pair and somebody has the straight, you are just absolutely crushed. You'd have to go runner, runner and hit, uh, runner, runner and hit a full house or uh, a quads. And that's not going to happen very often. So these lockdown boards can be good boards. But again, more against a, a tag type opponent and probably heads up. Uh, Multi-way, it's just too likely that somebody could have hit the hand that you're representing. So be careful about that. Okay. Let's talk about the next factor, which is the number of opponents and the type of opponents. So obviously, it's better to check raise heads up. I mean, that's that's quite clear. Uh, there's only one person that you have to fold out. Okay, you're not going against multiple opponents. C betting frequencies are much higher heads up, as we talked about in my previous video on C betting. In PLO heads up, people C bet not quite as much as hold them, but in the ballpark. 
people are see betting 70 plus percent of the time heads up on you know most boards not some of those boards I just mentioned paired boards and things like that but on most boards people are see betting pretty frequently so it makes it a good spot to check raise because the odds are very good that your opponent is going to see bet you only have one opponent and finally the amount of equity flopped is lower okay when you've only got four cards out there versus 12 or 16 cards it's just that much less likely that anybody hits something that anybody being one opponent so heads up is clearly the very best spot to check raise uh, however as I mentioned earlier on monotone and paired boards there's some good opportunities against say two opponents and there's a couple reasons for that number one our bet is usually going to get a lot of respect because as I said those are the kind of boards that either you hit or you completely whiff when it's a monotone board you have a flush or you basically have nothing you know, unless you maybe hit a set and I folded many sets on monotone boards against uh, say three opponents because it's just too easy for someone to have a, f a flush and then I'm unless I get lucky I'm done um, so when you bet into two people on a board like that they just have to give you credit for you know for trips or for a flush if they don't have it themselves um, so those are great spots because they generally have very little and you're betting into two people you're gonna get some you're raising into two people you're gonna get some credit if there's any more than two opponents do not check raise unless you have strong equity meaning for value so what I'm saying is if it's three or more opponents do not bluff check raise I don't care what the board is I don't care who the opponents are in my opinion that's a bad idea you're now talking there's 12 cards out there or more and just the rule of collateral and just the way PLO works it's just too likely that somebody hits something they're willing to continue with okay any more than two opponents in my opinion it's too risky and I would say do not do it now what type of players are best to do check raising with air against well the main players to target are those that see bet too much and that isn't necessarily a bad player that could be a, a tag like myself I'm gonna show in the hand hitter examples some examples I've played against some tags who are play similar to myself but but heads up they're see betting 80 90 percent of the time they're just always see betting against a player like me heads up because they just believe that I'm gonna fold most of the time I'm a tight tag and so uh, the one way to combat a player like that is to check raise them because now you're repping a big hand and they're not gonna play a big hand without a big hand themselves right they're not gonna put a lot of money in without something big so we want to target people that see bet too much that could be a good player that could be a bad player uh, and of course the agromaniac is a great target in that spot these are the kind of people that as you know they are raising with any four cards and then when the flop comes it gets checked to them they're gonna pot it with just on any board against any opponent they do not care it's an automatic hit the pot button when it comes to them but bear in mind it's got to be the type of maniac that will fold when he faces resistance if you recall the presentation it was quite some time ago what I gave player types in PLO I talked about that there are two types of maniacs one is the type that just doesn't care if he wins or loses basically he's just always raising always betting always putting money in and he'll do it with the nuts and he will do it with air and he's willing to stack off with air he just doesn't care he's counting on you folding and if you don't fold he's willing to take that chance he just rebuy and start over again it's just what he does those are bad people to check raise because that they won't fold even if they have air they just won't but there's also a, a lot of maniacs out there that will be super aggressive until you play back at them especially if you're a, a tag like myself and once they realize that you have something now they'll give up they realize okay I can't push him off his hand I gotta wait for the next hand and then I'll try to push him off his hand they do the same thing over and over and over but they will give up when they face resistance those are great opponents to check raise as I said tight tags and like myself I'm quite willing to admit this we're also very good types heads up because we will just simply will not play a big pot without a big hand one of the expressions I like in poker that I learned early on is you know you play small pots with small hands and big pots with big hands okay when you have a small hand don't play a big pot okay it's not worth it not worth it to play a guessing game and try to figure out if your opponent is just trying to push you around let it go wait for a better spot you've all heard me say that millions of times 
And so I admit that heads up, you check to me and I see bet and you check raise me, I'm not going to call you if I don't have a pretty big piece of that board. So people like myself are good targets in heads up pots on dry boards. So the key here is that it, our opponents, the people we choose to do it against, they need to be able to fold if they don't have much. Okay, There's really not much worse than see betting with air. They call you. The turn comes. You have to check fold. And then they, they show their cards and they've got like third pair or, or ace high or something. We've all seen it happen, at least those that have done the check raise. They're all proud of themselves because, you know, ha, 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 ha. I called you with air and I won the pot. Well, okay. They do that often enough, you, as you well know, they're going to lose their stack. We don't know who it'll be to. It may not be to you. You may not get lucky enough. But my point is that type of play is going to bite them in the ass. It already has. It will continue to. But it's not fun to have that happen. So choose wisely is what I'm saying, okay? Uh, choose wisely, grasshopper. Pick an opponent that you know that if they don't have a lot, they're going to let it go because you don't want to, you know, be put in that spot where they call you. You say, oh, crap, I guess they had a good hand, and it turns out they didn't have squat, and you just wasted money. All right, let's talk now about a, a subset of this, and that's check raising when you do have equity. And by equity, I don't mean the nuts. I don't mean a really strong draw or a, a pretty big hand. I mean just a little bit of equity. So what about when we're out of position and we flop a small piece of the board or we have, say, a backdoor draw? Is that also a candidate to check raise versus complete air? Is it worth it? Well, there are some spots where it is. If we hold nut blockers, and of course by nut blockers, I'm talking about, um, say, you hold the ace of hearts and it's a, a two-tone board or something. So now if you have a competent opponent, you know, they have to worry, right? Whatever flush they hit, it's not going to be the nut flush. You have a blocker to the nut. You may not have two hearts. You don't have a flush draw yourself because then you'd have some, some equity on the board, obviously. But you have a blocker. If they start putting money in or money starts going and they have to worry, well, does he have the nut flush? Because they know they can't have it. They don't have the ace of hearts, all right? So that's what a nut blocker is. And there's other examples, but that's the best example. Uh, or we have some backdoor draws, uh, plus, say, a pair, a piece of the board, like second pair. Check raising can be a viable option. So let me give an example here. Let's say that we have king, queen, jack, ten with a suit. This is a very solid starting hand. It's a beautiful rundown, and we're suited. This is a hand that I would raise with from almost any position. Uh, really, any position. I would raise with this uh, uh, under the gun. I would call a raise from any position, including uh, the blinds. This is a hand you want to see a flop, but it's a nice hand. So let's say we either raise or we call a raise. And we're out of position, so probably, you know, say we called a raise from the blinds with this. And the flop comes 10, 4, 5, rainbow. So we do flop top pair, but that's not, you know, in PLO, top pair isn't very much, as you guys know, okay? Well, these kind of boards get seabed a lot, because, again, we've got kind of the high, low, low. Now, the two low cards are connected, so it's not quite that, but... This is a somewhat, this is a, a dry-ish light board, as I would call it. If you go back to my uh, my presentation on sea bedding and, you know, the board textures, this would be called a dry-ish light flop. Although there is obviously a straight possibility with the 4 or 5. But anyways, these kind of boards get sea bed a lot, especially heads up. But the problem is that very few hands can continue against a check raise. Okay. Even an overpair is in a tough spot. So if somebody has, you know, ace, ace, xx, and we check, they see bet, which is a very legitimate see bet because they have a pair of aces, right? And now we check raise them. We're representing a really strong range. Okay, we're basically repping a set, uh, two pair, or a big draw. For example, we're repping, let's say we have seven, eight, and then maybe, like in this case, uh, uh, say a backdoor, here we have a backdoor diamond draw. Okay, so we're, we're repping, say, uh, a, a straight, an open-ended straight draw and a backdoor diamond draw at worst. And more likely, we're repping a set or two pair. Well, against that kind of range, a pair of aces is doing very poorly. Okay, very poorly. They are they're flipping at best and not even. And that's against the bottom of the range we're repping our draw. If we have the two pair of the set, they're doing quite poorly, um, especially against a set, obviously. Um, and if they decide to call the raise, 
it can put them in a lot of awkward turn spots, okay? Because how often does somebody check raise the flop and then check fold the turn? You know, as I spoke about earlier, obviously when these bluffs don't work, we're going to be check folding the turn. But the idea is they don't know we're bluffing. We don't do this that often, and we're a tight player. Okay, when I check raise, people tend to give me credit, at least anybody that knows me, okay? Part of the reason it works for me is that people know that I don't play big pots without big hands. So I'm repping a monster range when I check raise you, okay? And <clears throat> more important than that, I'm going to be pouring more money in on the turn. If I really do have the set on this board, and, and I, with a set I will check raise this board quite readily, when the turn comes, I'm going to be potting it almost 100% of the time. Okay, maybe if a six comes, I might be a little worry or something like that. But if like a a king comes or a, a jack or something like that, I'm going to bomb a full pot bet in. So the person that calls with their overpair, they have to understand that they're going to be facing a monster bet on the turn. And if they don't improve, how happy are they going to be about calling that big bet? So a lot of times that will deter them from calling on the flop because they may have a hand and they may wonder what you have, but they know that if you're not bluffing, if you really do have the range you're representing, you're going to be bombing the turn and they're going to have to fold. So better to fold now than to put the money in and then fold on the turn because we're just not going to be check raising the flop and then giving up. And if we do get called, the good news is that we have a lot of cards that we will improve our equity. Any 10, any 9, any 8, any ace, any king, any queen, any jack, those will all give us some kind of draw or a pair or two pair. Uh, two pair, that is, or, or a further draw or a flush draw. Any diamond gives us a flush draw. That gives us more equity. Any of these cards and could allow us to possibly barrel the turn. Okay, and now if they didn't call the flop with a monster hand themselves, they are going to have to give up. Those aces are going to have to go in the muck if the turn is anything other than an ace for them. Ace comes on the turn, they're probably not folding. But anything else, and they're going to have to dump it then. And so we can pick up some good equity and barrel. Our potential equity plus our fold equity adds up to a profitable check raise scenario okay so the fact that we do have some equity on this board and a decent chance to improve plus the fact that we're repping a super strong range and we're a tight player and so we have good fold equity most opponents will not continue that gives us a very nice check raise scenario okay all right so at this point let's take a look at some examples I've been talking a lot about uh, the theory behind it and uh, what spots we want to do it in. Let's take a look in my database where I chose to check raise as a bluff and talk about why I thought it was a good spot to do so. Okay, so let me call this up and let's uh, let's do it. Okay, so here's the first one. <clears throat> We're only three-handed here at this table. I guess some players had left. It is uh, Myself, this Ful Fulminio, who's a very poor player, 90-43. I've played a lot against this guy. He's from Italy. Very, very uh, crazy, wild, bad player. And then Damien, 27, who's a lot like myself. He plays looser, 41-10. He plays more hands. He raises a bit more, but he's basically a tag. You notice he's winning 52% of his hands at showdown. Uh, you know, he only see bets 27% of the time. Okay. Uh, his aggression factor is, I'm low, but this is only 65 hands. I was low here. We're, we're very close. My long-term aggression factor is 1.2 or something, 1.1. We have very close stats in a lot of areas. Uh, you know, continued plea flop raise, I'm 33, he's 37. Um, he's um, a, a solid tag. Okay, so, so Fulminio raises on the button. That means nothing. This person raises 43% of the time. That's basically any four cards especially on the button. I have a pretty nice rundown here. 7-8 jack queen suited to the queen. This is a nice hand. I'd be calling a raise against a lot of people with this hand, but certainly against this player I'm going to be. So I call Damien Folds. Well, here's the classic paired board. I really don't hit anything on this board, guys. I have a backdoor spade flush draw, third nut only, and that's it. I don't have anything, right? I got no pair. Uh, a backdoor flush draw, no straight draw. I'd have to go runner-runner to hit a straight. 
or a flush. So I have two backdoor draws, I guess you could say, and that's it. So now look at Fulminio C bet, 92%. Look at that. That'd be high in, in, in Hold'em, really high. In PLO, that's, that's outrage. 55 out of 60 times this person is C-bet. That's terrible. This session, 21 to 23. They're always betting. So what do I do? I check it. Of course, they C-bet. I bomb a pot size check raise. If they don't have a three or maybe a, a flush draw in this case, this is a two-tone board. But they need to have a flush draw, and even then, uh, they're they're you know, going to be losing the most of the time against order three. They have to give up, and they fold. Okay, this is a pretty good spot, and I know this player. And as wild and bad as this player plays, we've played against each other, and this person knows that when I do that, I've got a three. I'm only doing, and I may have a flush draw too. But they, if they don't have a big piece of this board, they just have to let it go. And this was a good spot to to check raise. Okay, let's look at the next one. Here we've got uh, four players. And uh, this I am Hardwell is kind of a taggish player. I guess looks like 92 Mello is sitting out here, but they're pretty wild. Chota, 71-7, is a poor player. Uh, and this Giovanna is what I call loose passive, 51-7. And here I am with a really nice uh, suited rundown. Very nice starting hand for PLO. So I am Hardwell raises on the button. <clears throat> and I uh, don't know if we can get up his. Yeah, so, you know, on the button, I guess he hasn't raised that much. But I thought he was fairly wide on the button. We don't really have a lot of stats on him. But uh, his, his range is not super wide. But it, this is not just, you know, premium hands by any stretch of imagination. But it doesn't really matter. This is a strong enough hand to call a raise versus anybody, okay, even out of position. In PLO, you have a rundown like this with a suit and a, a suit to the ace. This is a very good hand, and I'm just never fooled. I'm calling a three bet with this hand. If this guy had raised and he three bet, I'm going to be calling and seeing a flop. So that's how good this hand is. I'm definitely calling, and I do. And here's again sort of that classic paired board, 775. Now, this is a bit wetter. Because the two cards are closer together, somebody could have 6-8. There is a flush draw out there, which I don't have. But this, in general, is a board that either you hit or you don't. Okay. Now, his C-bet percentage is only 20-25. He hasn't C-bet that much, but we have very low numbers, only four. Okay. So it's a sample of four, so it doesn't mean a lot. But this is a board that generally you hit or you don't, and most of the time, you don't. So I check, and notice how large he see bets here. If he doesn't have anything, he'd be much smarter to bet like 40 cents here, something like that. But he bets very large. I decide to check raise. So now think about it. Let's say he has a jack high flush draw. Okay, let's just say he has jack something of spades. All right. I was going to say queen, I have the queen. But let's say he has, let's, let's say he had the queen. Let's say this wasn't a queen. Let's say he had the queen high flush draw here. Well, now he's got to call almost another $2. If the turn is not a spade, he's basically done with the hand, right? He doesn't have enough equity to go to the river, and he just dumped two bucks almost for nothing, $1.95. If the flush does come, he's got to worry, well, is my flush good? This guy's a tight tag. I mean, so far in the, I was 13-2 in this session. I had not been getting any cards. So he's got to worry. What if this guy has the ace or king high flush draw? I could get stacked, lose everything, even though I have a flush. So that's what makes a check raise like this so uh, powerful and so successful. Not only is he unlikely to hit this board. Okay, if he has a seven, he's not folding. And I know that. And then, okay, I lose my 250 and I move on such as life but if he even had a, a flush draw that wasn't you know the nutted flush draw he's really got to worry because I can have a higher flush draw and then of course secondly on a paired board I can hit a full house and beat his flush so there's just so many things to worry about he just dumps the hand I don't think he had anything but I'm saying he could have had something here and he really still has to give up most of the time 
this is a good spot against one opponent. Now I would not see I would not check raise this board against multiple opponents. It's a little too wet. But against one opponent, much like the last board, it's a very good spot. Let's look at the next one. Okay, so we're four-handed again. You notice I'm choosing spots where generally I'm against one, maybe two opponents at most. I'm not really doing it in spots against uh, uh, a bunch of opponents. And look at our opponents here. 86-4, 86, four, 86 85 8. These are all very loose opponents, weak opponents, but the key is can they fold when they face aggression from a tight player? Here I am at 27 2, by far the tightest player at the table. I get a limp. This guy raises. 85 8. Now I obviously am going to call here. You notice he doesn't raise that much. He's a loose player, very loose, 85% hands, but it doesn't raise that much. But I have kings with a suit, so I'm just not really going anywhere. I wonder if, if I flopped a set here, then I picked up the wrong hand. But let's see. Hopefully I got this one correct. And we get a call. Okay, I do not. So this is a pretty dry flop. This is an example of the high, low, low. Okay, nine isn't super low hand, but, but relatively high, low, low rainbow. So this is the kind of board where it's hard for somebody to flop a lot of equity. And even if somebody hits the ace, they have to worry about a set. It's very easy for somebody to have a set of nines on this board. Really easy. And you're drawing basically dead against that because there's no other draws on this board. If you have an ace XXX hand, you're drawing to two outs. That's it. You don't hit another ace, you are. And actually, then you're gone unless you, you fill up because I would then have a full house, nines full of aces. So if another ace comes, unless you had also, uh, you know, you hit another card that gives you a bigger full house. You're, you're so with a pair of aces here or two pair, you're just you're just basically drawing dead. And notice there is no other, there's no other draw. You know, if there was a draw where you could hit a straight or a flush, then you can beat a set. But without a draw, it's going to be awfully tough. So I check, Wolfgang checks, and this poor player bets half pot. So. I go ahead and make a big raise. I just don't think he has a lot here necessarily, and I'm going to take a shot. And notice I got two opponents, but it's a very dry board. Uh, these two people know me, and they know that I'm repping a huge range here, a huge, a really strong hand, and they both fold. Now, this isn't something I do all the time, but here and there, it can be very powerful. If you know your opponents can fold, and the board is unlikely to hit them, and they're very likely. He's in position. We both checked. He's quite likely to see bet with his orange. And notice again, look at his see bet percentage 80%. Small sample, but this is a guy that see bets a lot. And so, a really good spot to take advantage and pick up the dead money. All right, move to the next one. Here we are at a more full table, five of us. And notice the players here. We've got this game over, 4624, classic lag. Pete the Rock, 6858. This guy is, a, I guess I called it a maniac, not in the 80s, but I mean, he is, I mean, he's playing 70% of hands and raising 60%. He's quite a wild player. Wildly lag. This H1, uh, more of a loose passive. And then Poker Life, 8125, very loose player. Here I am, 14-0. Look at that. Of course, I only had 22 hands in, but look at how I stand out on this table of just wild players. This is why I play Juicy Stakes, by the way, guys, because of people like this. They give me money. So I'm sitting here in the small blind with uh, an okay hand. I have a suited ace, uh, connected cards. It's not a big hand, but it's, you know, better than average. So I probably wouldn't call a raise with this hand because I'm really basically playing two cards. A hand like this, the problem is you basically got a suited ace king. The seven eight don't do you a lot of good. Okay, yes they're connected, but they don't do you a lot of good. They're too far away from the ace king. They're not that strong. So you're really just playing a suited ace king, and that's not enough. But because it's limped, I'll go ahead and call five cents and try to see a flop. Now game over could raise. Is that kind of guy? But I decide to put in the five cents. Excuse me and. He does end up raising, which is not surprising, but I know that that doesn't necessarily mean he has a good hand. That's just the way he plays. He's very lag. So I decide to call. 
I feel like uh, if I can hit a hand, I have a good chance against him. And he tends to be very aggro. And I also recognize, I believe, that this is a spot where I'm at a position I could check raise him because he is going to be uh, betting a lot of boards. So the flop comes down, and here we have the classic paired board for Jack Jack. Now, people do play, I'd rather it be 4 4 Jack, I guess. But the point being, if he doesn't have a Jack, there just isn't much that he can do in this spot, especially against a, a player like me. So uh, I go ahead and I check. And he bets two thirds pot. And I lower the hammer. So now, once again, it's very similar to the other one. This board's a bit wetter because we do have the flush draw, but he's got a call over $2 here. So again, even if he has a flush draw, if it's not a nut flush draw, he's really got to decide, you know, is it worth it? Because I'm repping here a jack, maybe a flush draw myself. Um, and so he has to decide, you know, how much money do I want to put in when I could be drawn dead? If a flush comes, I could still lose. Or I could lose to a full house. So basically, without a jack, even with a flush draw, unless it's the nut flush draw, and even then he's taking a big chance against a player as tight as me, 14-0. Going to cost him a lot of money to play a guessing game as to whether or not he's good. So he dumps it. Perfect spot to burn him and pick up not only the pot, but his two-thirds C-bet. Okay, now... These plays don't work all the time, obviously. Nothing works all the time, okay? The ones I've shown you so far were all good spots, and they worked. But there's going to be good spots where it doesn't work, okay? It was nothing wrong with the fact that you chose to do it. Good board, good opponent. It's just, you know, they had a hand. And let's look at one of those. All right, so we get a min raise from our good old buddy Bingo Bob. And Bingo Bob, I've played against a lot. You can see the hands here. He hasn't been in Juicy Stakes for a while. But Bingo Bob is a, a looser tag than me, but still a tag. Always, when he does raise, he always min raises. He tries to put in as little money as he can pre-flop. And then he waits to see if he hits a hand. And then he'll pile in the money post-flop if he has a big hand. What I noticed, though, when I was going up against Bingo Bob, was that when he was up against just me, he was c-betting very high percent of the time. Because he knows I'm a tight player, and uh, he's more of a risk taker than me. And so when we were heads up, you notice he only c-bets 33% of the time, which is pretty typical for PLO, a good player in PLO. But when we were heads up, he was c-betting probably 85 plus percent of the time. So I was looking at ways to try to get the better of him, and I thought, well, this this may be a way as I can check raise on these these good boards because he just doesn't hit them that often, and he's always c-betting. So everybody else folds. It's only 10 cents for me to call here. I don't have a particularly strong hand, but it's 10 cents. And uh, so I decided to do so. I could get lucky and flop a big flush draw or straight draw or something. So I call. So again, we get this paired board. Now he did raise under the gun, so he could certainly have an ace. But Bingo Bob doesn't just raise with, you know, aces under the gun or something like that. And I did actually flop a piece of this board. I do have a 10. So... I check. He c bets half pot, his standard thing, and I go ahead and raise him. And if he doesn't have an ace or a strong, you know, flush or straight draw, he pretty much has to give up here. I'm repping a pretty strong range. Well, nothing works every time he calls. So now I'm like, oh crap. So unless a 10 comes on the turn, I'm kind of, and even then I could be dead, basically. Right? It doesn't. The flush comes in. Well, I have two pair here, but I mean a crappy two pair. I don't even really have two. It's aces and tens. I have a pair of tens, basically. And that's it. And so at this point, I just have to give up. I check. You know, he bets. And what am I going to do, right? I'm going to sit there and try to bluff him again. That's no point. Uh, and I just fold. So nothing works every time. And in this case, it didn't work. He had an ace or something like that. And, and so be it. But I think that was a reasonable spot to try it. Um, and now let's look at our final one, and it's going to be another one against our good pal, Bingo Bob. So these two people fold, and Bob does his classic min raise on the button. This is his whole reign. Now, just the two of us, that's his entire reign. Bingo Bob is going to raise just about any four cards against me when he's got position. I don't have a super good hand, but I do have a suited queen, 
I do have a couple Broadway cards. The eight is somewhat connected. This is a dangle, clearly, but it's not a terrible hand. And for 10 cents, I call. Well, and we get another one. This time it's not two aces, though. So nine, nine, ace, the classic poured, a paired board. Rainbow this time, though. So a little bit drier than the last one. So I check. Bingo Bob does his classic half pot C bet. I raise him. He lets it go. So it worked one time, it didn't work the other time. But uh, I started doing some of these things, you know, looking at how to play against guys like this and how to take advantage of one there. Because heads up, he was C betting more than 80% of the time against me. And so this is a good way to combat that. He has to give me some credit for hand. He's like me, he's not going to play a big pot without a big hand. Notice he wins money at showdown 63% of the time. Okay. Here I didn't have as many hands on him. This is early in our history. But at this point, you know, 40 out of 63 times, he won money at showdown. So he's not going to showdown without a pretty good hand. And so he's just not going to call a raise here without a nine. It's just that plain and simple. Okay. So that's uh, all the examples that I'm going to give. And um, let's go back to this. Okay, so let's uh, summarize what we uh, have talked about here today. Because PLO is a game of the nuts, our opponents are uh, more so, I believe, than Hold'em, really forced to take check raises very seriously. Obviously, a check raise is a powerful move in Hold'em also. But in Hold'em, people can check raise with a little bit uh, uh, more wider ranges and different ends because you know people will check raise with just a draw with a, a top pair hand you know you have you raise with ace jack and the flop comes <clears throat> ace nine five you may check raise somebody just to try to uh you know get more money in than just standard c bet uh take advantage of an aggressive player or something like that and all you have is a pair uh but in, in PLO, because it's a game of the nuts and because people hit so much, hits the board so much harder and hit so many more hands, when you do check raise somebody, they have to take it really seriously. And they basically have to give up with anything but the strongest holdings. Okay, Unlike in Hold'em where you might be able to call a check raise with just a pair or uh, some kind of draw. Uh, maybe even second pair with a really strong kicker and a, a back door or something like that. Um, but in PLO, you just can't call check raises without a really big hand yourself due to the nature of the game and that it's a game of the nuts. So when we do it properly and in the right spot, it, it not only lets us win hands we should be losing. And I talked about that earlier. When you're out of position with complete air, you're in the worst possible spot in all of poker, right? You just have no equity, no chance to improve, no nothing. You should be losing those hands 99% of the time. So when you can actually turn around and win a hand like that, that's like finding money on the street. That's like walking down the street and just there's a $10 bill on the ground and you just pick it up. Nobody's around. It's just literally free money. On top of that, it makes those future situations easier to play. Because as they say, you've heard the expression once bitten, twice shy. Okay, and that's really talking about, about a dog. That expression comes from that, you know, if you've been bitten by a dog, you, you never quite look at dogs the same, right? Once you've been bitten, the second time around, you're pretty shy around dogs. When I was like six years old, I was bitten by a dog, actually. I uh, was with my father, and we were at like a pharmacy or something. We parked in the parking lot, and we walked up to the entranceway, and somebody had tied their dog off in the front. And I was a little kid. I was five or six years old, didn't know anything. And I walked up. I was like, doggy. And I walk up. I reach my hand out to pet it, and the dog bit my hand. And I started crying. And my father was furious. He went inside the store and talked to the manager, and they got on the uh intercom and said the person with the dog in the front come outside and this woman came out and my dad started screaming at her he said why would you leave a dog out front that would bite someone what kind of person are you he was screaming at this poor woman um she was probably early 20s and she said oh he's had all the shots he doesn't have rabies i'm really sorry i don't know why he did that but the point being i remember for the next couple of years few years i was scared of dogs because i've been bitten and once it happens it's hard to forget and I remember any time I saw a dog after that as a young kid, I was, I was afraid. I thought I might get bitten and I wouldn't pet dogs. So it's really that concept works in, in everything. And it's true here. Once you check raise somebody a couple times, they are going to have the fear of God in them, as I said. They're going to be a little bit cautious about, about sea betting every time, you know, about 
uh, uh, taking chances against you about the size of their bets and everything it's going to make them think twice so it can really help you in future spots and have you get a lot more boards uh, you know checked to you and stuff and allow you as I said to realize more equity because you're getting free cards the key guys the key to check raising with air is that our bluff needs to be believable number one okay so they got to believe that we could hold something on that board so that's why those monotone boards and those paired boards are really good because it's it's PLO and so people flop flushes and people flop trips it happens the rule of collateral right so people don't have a hard time believing you have something on that board they may look at a board like king eight three and say well you don't have squat there or maybe a, a set is all you could rep there maybe on a dry board like that uh, but on a paired board or a monotone board they they have a harder time trying to write off that you don't have anything so it's it can be quite believable that you have a big hand secondly the board texture needs to be such that it's very unlikely that they hit much so again going back to those boards on a monotone flop on a paired board and in that case even like on a high low low most of the time our opponents just don't hit much. they either hit something big or they hit nothing so those are good boards where it's believable that we have something and they most likely don't have squat and finally it must be against an opponent that's capable of folding not some whale that's willing to play a big pot with just a pair literally like third pair or a so-so draw or next to nothing don't check raise against an opponent that is just out there to gamble doesn't give a damn if they win or lose they're just pushing buttons and they can't fold that's the wrong person to do it against because they'll they'll play with air okay they don't care that they have air they'll still call you the final point I want to make is we don't want to overdo it okay I showed you six examples don't think I did that all in, in like two days or something you really shouldn't be doing this more than maybe once or twice a session okay not a table a whole session where you're playing three tables four tables two tables whatever it might be this is not something you want to do too much okay because the more you do it the less credibility you get obviously people are gonna believe you the first time and probably believe you the second time you do it three times in like 30 hands you're gonna start to get called down lighter or somebody's gonna play they're gonna recheck raise you and try to see what you have it's just not worth it choose your spots it's a tool that you use here and there on occasion in the right spot to make a little extra money and to you know make people think twice about what you have but don't overdo it all right so that's all I have guys uh, thanks as always for watching I hope that you uh, enjoyed uh, this presentation and uh, please leave any questions or comments in the forums I don't think I've seen one yet but if everyone does come up I'll be happy to answer it and until next time this has been CF the natural for grinderschool.com and good luck at the tables